Okay, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in this world. Welcome to the 2024 Theological Conference. This is the schedule on the event page, theologicalconference.org. You can see there we will start this morning, April the 6th, with uh, Matt Sacra, and then a recording presentation from Barbara Buzzard with Break for Lunch and back in the afternoon for the rest of today. So once again, first of all, I'd like to thank all our speakers for their hard work, their continued ministries. Uh, some of them are battling health issues like most of us uh, now and then. So please uh, prayers for all the presenters and their families, etc. And um, with that in mind, I'll open with prayer this uh, morning's events. Father, we thank you for this time, the ability to do this, the uh, pleasure and excitement of all the viewers out there who are live with us. We once again pray for the speakers and their families and their ministries and uh, that the evil one may not affect or continue to affect them. We pray for this world, Father, for the uh, less fortunate than us, for the wars and all the awful things that happen in this present evil age. And most of all, we pray for the messages here uh, today, all throughout uh, this Saturday, that uh, it may find eyes that are open as well as ears, and that the seed of the gospel about the kingdom and the things regarding your, your son Jesus, the Messiah, may be heard and understood. And with that in mind, we always pray in his name. Amen. All righty. So what else do we have for you? Uh, so on the main event website, you can go to presenters. And there's the uh, 2024 lineup. So last night we had Robin Todd and Pastor Gill. And you can go to our YouTube Focus on the Kingdom channel to see the Recordings, by the way, the live streams are automatically uploaded on the YouTube page. And uh, if you go at the bottom of the presenters page, you can click on papers and you should be able to see the uh, papers for the presenters. And there's a disclaimer that um, I'll just read. Some of the beliefs and opinions by presenters may not necessarily reflect the beliefs and views of Restoration Fellowship. So just as a small disclaimer there, but obviously for the most part, we are united in what we would regard as the fundamentals of our faith. Uh, there is a free draw, and I put it in the chat. If you would like to take part in this free draw to enter, please email me, and it is to win an item from the KLG Mission Store. So just go to klgmissions.com, click store, click visit store, and you can see all kinds of goodies you can win from sweaters and shirts. And of course, the messages are the great part of this. And I love that green one, by the way, and I'd like to thank Tracy for, uh, for this uh, great work she does. So to enter the, door, the draw for free, a free item from this store, email me, carlos at thehumanjesus.org. Of course, one, uh, one uh, what's it called? Draw per, per person, per customer, as they say. So please email me and we will be doing the draw tonight. So again, today is April the 6th. So if you can get your, your email to me before, let's say, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tonight, again, April the 6th, uh, please do so, and you'll be entered into the draw. So if you're watching this on a, you know, Monday, April the, what is it, 8th, obviously <laughs> that won't work. So, so please get in your name to me uh, before 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time these this evening tonight uh the other thing i had on in the chat is about our conference so uh for some time now well actually since the pandemic uh days 2020 
uh, the conference has been online, but we are thinking uh, to once again go back in person. So if we had uh, the conference in person uh, once again, and we are in the south of Atlanta, Georgia, by the way, and it would probably be around the springtime here, which would be probably April, uh, so next year, uh, would you attend? So please email me with a yes or a no, or maybe, or likely, and uh, just getting some votes, some feedback to see if we can go back to an in-person meeting and email me at carlos, again, at thehumanjesus.org. Just doing a, a little poll, I guess you might call it. All righty, without further ado, as they say, let us go to our presenters. I'll just read the bios we have here and our presenter here, Matt Sacra. So Matt uh, holds bachelor's and master's degrees in history and before retiring from a 20 year army career, he taught strategy innovation history at West Point. Matt authored a book on his faith and growth in combat combat as well as multiple articles on the faith uh, tied to his passion for the Judeo-Christian history and biblical truth. Uh, Matt currently teaches as a certified Pennsylvania social studies teacher and has uh, helped lead and teach since 2016 as one of the elders for All for Christ Fellowship, which includes members of the Body of Christ from around the U.S. and the world. Their fellowship strives to continually maintain a good and right loving relationship with God and Jesus, focused on preparation for the kingdom of God and his judgment through the lens of his new covenant as they refrain from sin, walking in obedience and righteousness. And you can reach Matt, as you can see, all for Christ fellowship, one word, at gmail.com. So the title for this year, uh, the Obedience of Faith, and I'll let uh, Matt introduce uh, his presentation here. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, Carlos. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good. No microphone right. issues. Yeah, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm here live for the entire time, but uh, Carlos and I, we were doing some tests early in the week, and I was having some microphone issues. One of my microphones died. So I, while I had one working, I decided to go ahead and record that. So we're playing the recorded version that I just made the other night. Um, but I am here for questions. And um, without further ado, we can go ahead and start it. And uh, I will be here live for questions right afterwards as well. Yep, sorry, I was muted again. <laughs> Apologies. So yes, as Matt said, he'll be on live and he'll take any comments or questions. Please type them in all caps if you can for my benefit so I can see them. One question per customer, as they say, as time permits here. So please make it a good one. And uh, so once again, Matt will come on with me live after his presentation. the agenda we're going to start with the context and the introduction of the obedience of faith as a phrase we'll look at old testament and new testament support including the teachings of jesus and then reactions that people have including ourselves and what overcoming looks like and finally finish with what the obedience of faith does not mean so from the beginning i would submit that obedience to jesus is expected commanded possible and is essential to inherit the kingdom. It is difficult to piece together truth sometimes on this journey that we're all on, much like a puzzle. And like a puzzle, sometimes information or the pieces look alike, or it is hard to determine where they go. We can have them close to an area we think they go, but sometimes we can be off track or sometimes in the right spot, but just need to turn the piece a different way. Scripture can be a lot like this too. Just like a puzzle, it can be helpful to start with what is laid out clearly for us, which on a puzzle would be the edge pieces, particularly the four corners. So years ago, it occurred to me that it might be helpful to depict in my mediocre slideshow skills what four corner puzzle pieces I could find from the words of Jesus. 
In other words, what topics did he focus on the most when speaking? There is a great wealth of knowledge in scripture, but as an individual or as a group, we can only do so much with the time that we're given. What should we focus on the most? If Jesus is our example, we should recognize how important these topics were to him for context of what he stressed the most. For the upper left, God and Jesus corner, Jesus spoke of himself and his God and Father 460 times. This is not just their identity, important as that is, but also their relationship with each other, especially loving obedience. And of course with us, which leads to the next three corners. When I first began preaching proper repentance and freedom from sin over a decade ago, many people told me Jesus focused more on love and forgiveness than he spoke against sin and for repentance. But both turned out to be the same, 96 times each. And in the topics of being perfect or righteous and exhortations toward righteousness, the total for this corner is 225 times Jesus spoke on the topic. The kingdom of God, hope set before us, and warnings of judgment 167 times, and emphasis on his words for the new covenant versus the law of Moses 63 times. All of this to show statistically how important all four of these topics are, and especially our obedient relationship with Jesus and God to inherit the kingdom. In terms of obedience of the faith in the context of the puzzle piece of the gospel of the kingdom of God, I'd like to share this quote from over a decade ago by Sir Anthony Buzzard. It reads, the kingdom of God is your destiny to administer the world with Jesus when he returns. That's the primary meaning of kingdom. Now, we can extrapolate from that future meaning, of course, a present of the kingdom. Anything you want to say about the ethics of the kingdom now, the spirit of the kingdom, the promise of the kingdom, the lifestyle of the kingdom, that will work beautifully for the present. But to make that the overwhelming idea of the kingdom is false. The future kingdom is primarily what is meant by kingdom of God in the gospel. To unpack this, the kingdom is primarily future, but without these in the present, ethics, the spirit, the promise, and the lifestyle, you will never inherit it. Jesus, Paul, and the other apostles warned of this multiple times in the New Testament. Simply put, strategy is how to accomplish a goal or an end. Our goal is the kingdom. The ways are listed here. So we have obedience now would be the main way, and we see this played out with the ethics now of love of God and neighbor, as Jesus emphasized in Matthew 22, with spirit of God and Christ in you to overcome, as Jesus emphasized in John 14 through 16 and Romans 8 for Paul, and then repentance and belief or faith in the kingdom promise, as Jesus emphasizes in Mark 1. And then a lifestyle that is free from or dead to sin, as Jesus emphasizes in John 8 and Paul in Romans 6 and 8 emphasizes. Note that part of this how is the spirit of God and Christ, their operational power and presence in us, opening our hearts to truth, often via scripture and the body of Christ to help us overcome. See Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 for equipping and edifying that the body of Christ does. Obedience was so important to God, he put it 14 times in the entire Bible, which doesn't seem like much, but he has the term obey 108 times, over half of which, 57 total, are God's desire for us to obey. Me, in quotes, that would be God saying obey me, my voice or his voice, in the third person at times, or the voice of the Lord. So with God and Jesus's emphasis on this, Paul couches his longest letter ever with the phrase, the obedience of faith. So this is part of the introduction here. It's a phrase that is mentioned in his longest letter, which is the letter to the Romans. He mentions it twice. It's a letter that was sent in advance to uh, the church at Rome around roughly 56 to 59 AD. We're not too sure of the date, of his arrival, which was likely in 60 AD. He mentions the word obedience seven times in the letter, in the beginning, the middle, and in the end. And he mentions the terms righteousness and obey 35 and three times each, respectively. So the context of where you first see this, as we come to our key phrase, the obedience of faith in the letter of Romans, is we can first see how well integrated the four topics of Jesus' emphasis are 
at work in Paul's introduction. We see God's kingdom gospel mentioned. We see who God and Jesus are, our relationship with them, and that is not just among the Israelites of the Old Covenant, but among all nations in the New Covenant, and all of this to bring about the obedience of the faith for the sake of his name, as you can see. And name means his authority, his character, his honor. So this is where it is in context, as you can see where I've bolded and underlined. Now, his closing or doxology of his letter to the Romans, we see the same four corners of the truth puzzle at work, three of them specifically to bring about the obedience of faith to God through Jesus. This is extremely important. So here's some more context. This is how common lexicons render faith in Greek and Hebrew. Note what I've bolded here. So you have moral conviction of religious truth, right? Especially reliance upon Christ for salvation, a constancy in such a profession. And then that last term there bolded fidelity. These are all extremely important. Same thing uh, that's with pistis in the Greek, with immuno in Hebrew, you have moral fidelity, faithful, stability, you're steady. These are, you're someone God can rely on. So the implication in the definition is a living faith, not a dead faith without works or, or of loyalty, um, but it's, it's with works of loyalty and faithfulness. Habakkuk 2.4 is a great example of, of this, uh, this passage in the Hebrew. It says the just or the upright or the righteous, depending on which version you look at, shall live by his faith or faithfulness, we could say. Romans 1.17, Paul echoes Habakkuk 2.4 in his introduction, just after his greetings. So faith and obedience go together perfectly, true faith implying obedience to the one in whom you're trusting. So here's the scriptures that we have. Get right into them. Genesis 49.10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. So a scepter is a symbol of rule and authority, of course. A lawgiver would be not just a law repeater, but an actual giver that is predicted of the Messiah. And notice also, to him, it says, shall be obedience of the people. Now, some versions render this gathering, but as you can see on Blue Little Bible here, um, and it's from Strong's definitions, it's a gathering to obey. Shiloh or Shiloh, as some would pronounce it, um, it's, it has an uncertain meaning, but it could possibly be tranquility. So there's a gathering to obey that's going on right now to this perfect tranquility we're gonna experience in the kingdom. Deuteronomy, this is one we're very familiar with, right? Hear or Shema, you know, hear, O Israel. The Lord our, is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul and with all your might. And also Deuteronomy 18, 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. So this is not just acknowledging that God is one, but it's loving him with all you have. And also note his then future expectation, God's future expectation to listen, hear, or obey Jesus. These are two things to avoid that we see in Leviticus 19.18. Not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the Shema plus this are echoed by Jesus in Mark chapter 12. 1 Samuel 15.22, note again here the similarity of Shema or hear to obey and obedience in the Hebrew. To hear is to obey his voice, which is better than sacrifice, and it gives God delight. And you can see, as I've put in the brackets there, Shema, hear, obey. It's, it's basically the same word. Undefiled is key, because Jesus speaks of what defiles us, even in the New Covenant, if you look at Mark 7 and Matthew 15. The law of the Lord was the Mosaic Covenant in King David's day when he wrote this psalm. But the New Covenant in Christ is for our day, so this would apply to us. Note our constant seeking and refraining from iniquity or sin. So blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. And then note here in verses 9 through 12 that cleansing comes from heeding slash obeying his word. 
hiding it in your heart, seeking him with all of yourself and your understanding. Yet there is still a desire for teaching or instruction. This is very important. In scripture, the word, um, word, davar in Hebrew or logos in Greek, is not just God's written word, but his spoken word to you. And in the new covenant, it is used once or twice for Jesus, yes, as the very embodiment of God's logic, his reason, his intent, or we could say his plan, which Jesus used dozens of times in the gospel of the kingdom. We could see Matthew 13 for the parable of the sower for this. So it's extremely important for not sinning against him to hide this in our heart. Here again, Psalm 119, 32, I will run the course of your commandments for you shall enlarge my heart. This is a big growth issue. Again, obedience doesn't mean we don't need further growth for ourselves and our understanding. We are still learning by the Spirit of God so God can enlarge our hearts. This makes us capable of more love, more understanding, and ultimately us more effective for the God, the kingdom, and for others. Psalm 119. Notice some of the bold words I have here. I've inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. I hate the double-minded, literally the divided heart or mind, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, you evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Do you have a divided heart? Or is it firmly set on obedience to the end of your life? If God's written and spoken word and his intent for your life are not part of your hope, you will be double-minded, which James tells us makes you unstable and fit to receive nothing from God. So intentionally incline your heart to obedience. Isaiah, note here, notice God's plea through Isaiah to stop evil, to do right, which is also expressed through specific actions. Further, he expects his people to be reasonable, willing, and obedient in order to avoid destruction. The same expectations we see in Ezekiel. Turn away from sin. Obey my decrees. Do what is just and right. And then you live and don't die. Notice also in verse 31 here of Ezekiel 18, the expectation for them to get a new heart and a new spirit. Also, notice how obedience equals life here in Ezekiel 20. And that refusal to obey equals fury and being consumed or destroyed. We see the same thing in the New Testament. Now, when we look at the Gospels, we'll look at those, especially from Jesus, and then we'll look at Romans, uh, some letters from Paul, and then we'll look at Hebrews. As... So when we look at Jesus' teachings, we notice immediately when he comes on the scene, he commands a change of heart and mind, which always leads to actions, setting before his audience the hope of the gospel of the kingdom as the purpose or motivation. He echoes the Shema that God is one. We should love him with all our hearts and love our neighbors as ourselves. Also noting, Matthew 22 here, that the entire law and prophets hang on this. He stressed knowing and believing from faith or entrusting oneself to both God and Jesus himself for life in the age to come. Smashing them into one person or one being is unhelpful to say the least. But also note in John 3.36 that belief in the Son is not only equated with eternal life or life in the age to come, but the very opposite of believing in the Son is refusing to obey him, which keeps us from life in the age to come and keeps us under God's wrath. It is also interesting to note that the Greek word for not obeying here is apatheo, which is the etymology of or where our word apathy comes from. So this is not just purposeful rebellion, but is also passive apathy or disinterest in obedience. Also, you could compare this verse with Hebrews 3, verses 18 through 19, where not obeying is identical to unbelief. In John 5 and 8, Jesus said, Sin no more to the former lame man and former adulteress. But would he and does he tell you and I the same? His very words mean it is not only possible, but expected of us. To claim, oh, it's not possible, or it doesn't apply to me, 
is merely faithless, disobedient garbage, to put it frankly. He's the one who said sinning makes you sin's slave. And if he sets you free, you are free. The question is, do you believe him? He also tells us how to love one another. It is in the same way he loved his disciples. He gave them hope, truth, encouragement, and the loving correction they needed, always cutting to the heart of every issue and especially speaking directly to their hearts and any issue within each of them. He led them by example as a true servant leader. A few things to notice uh, from this verse in Matthew 28. Jesus has all authority and it was given to him by God. We notice also the disciples and consequently we are not to make merely intellectual believers in God and Jesus, but make disciples, people who actually follow him in which we are teaching people to obey Jesus. We also notice this obedience includes all nations not just to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as previously in Jesus' ministry in Matthew 10, which is an indicator of the new covenant we are under. I also want to highlight the word baptizing. Although Jesus certainly baptizes with the Holy Spirit to those who obey him, see Acts 5.32, Jesus is not saying in this particular verse here, I, Jesus, will baptize with the Holy Spirit, even though he certainly does that. In Matthew 28 here, he is saying that we, his disciples, are to do it. When we compare this to the example he set for us in Matthew 3.15, it is clear that this is water baptism, since we cannot baptize people with the Holy Spirit. True, we can lay hands on people, which has led to Jesus baptizing people with the Holy Spirit. But baptism of the Holy Spirit is Jesus' job, not ours. Ours is to water baptize. Finally, I want to highlight the word obey here. Strikingly similar to the Hebrew word, the Greek tereo also means observe, obey, watch, in the sense of spiritually guarding to keep intact, as the HELPS word study shows. A guard on watch in every culture throughout history protects what is good and does not allow evil or danger in. Remember what God said to Cain in Genesis 4, sin lies at the door, so we need to remember the wisdom also of Proverbs 4.23, which tells us, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Now, many scholars have noted that Matthew divides Jesus' teachings into five major blocks, like five books of Torah. In total here, seven major sections, including the intro and birth narrative and the closing of his trial, crucifixion, and resurrection narratives. As you read or scan them on your own, you notice the emphasis of attitude, conduct, and endurance needed in this present age in order to see results in the age to come, i.e. in order to inherit the kingdom. My own reckoning as a historian when I examine the theme of Matthew's account of Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount to the multitudes and disciples is that he introduces the entire block or sermon with what we call the Beatitudes, or how those of us of a certain disposition, attitude, or way in this life now will end up being satisfied in some cases now, but especially so in the age to come. There is no reward for those who do not meet the necessary conditions set forth by Jesus. So if you look at this briefly, we see that the blessed who are poor in spirit, who mourn, meek, hunger, thirst, merciful, pure in heart, they're thirsting for righteousness, they're peacemakers, they're persecuted, reviled for righteousness sake, they're being salt and light. The great reward they get is the kingdom of God or inheriting the earth to be comforted, to be filled with, to have mercy and also to see God and be sons of God. Now, when we see eight major sections of the sermon, that show heart issues, which directly translate into actions, this is even more apparent. All of these address something within each of us, which equates to actions or conducts we conduct that we produce. These are all obedience issues, which deal with our heart or inner thoughts and understanding, including overcoming temptation, but also growth. It always begins with a change of your mind and heart, the left column, 
and then produces actionable results from you, which is the right column, or the actions you take of obedience in or by faith, which is constant moral fidelity or stability of character, as we've seen. Neither God nor Jesus nor the church do this for you, though they certainly will help you, as it is too difficult within your own strength. But you absolutely can obey, and Jesus gave no excuses for disobedience. So if you look at each of these, we've got hate and murder heart issues. We've got lust and adultery heart issues. We have tongue and speech and abundance of heart issue. We have vengeance as a heart issue. And all of these equate to actions of reconciliation or actions of faithfulness, or actions of seriousness of our words, or actions of love of enemy. Note again, pride, honor, heart issues, covetousness and focus, life's focus, heart issues, fear, anxiety, heart issues, sound judgment, heart issues. All of these equate to actions of prayer and our true focus, actions of our true life desires focus, actions of trusting or seeking God, and then actions of fixing ourself and others. So really take a look at these when you get some time and examine them in this context, in this light. And if these issues are not addressed within you, they come out of you and defile you, i.e. what comes out of the mouth and heart, as Jesus taught elsewhere, such as Matthew 15 and Mark 7, which I have combined here. So we can see all of these issues above they lead to what Jesus called evil thoughts, which is dialogismos, where we get the word dialogue from. Think internal dialogue. This is the reasoning, calculation, and deliberation and plotting someone does toward evil, right? Then you have murders, adulteries, fornications, covetousness, the evil eye, which alludes to envy or evil inclinations, thefts, false witnesses, deceit, wickedness, lewdness, that, that is indulgent behavior, that is without restraint. Blasphemy, pride, foolishness. These are what defile a man. These are also what Paul in Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians later figuratively calls the flesh or sarx in the Greek. But it's from Genesis 6-3 where God says man is indeed flesh. Jesus taught this as inclinations of the heart um, from Genesis 6-5. Those in inclinations within us toward evil or calamity or hurt or self-appetites. In Hebrew, it's yeser hara. Which, this is precisely why Solomon, in all his wisdom, explained that we must guard or watch or keep our heart with all diligence because out of it springs every issue. All of this relates to one of the most important parables Jesus told, especially when you compare how Matthew records Jesus' explanation of it to Mark 4-13 where Jesus stressed the importance of this particular parable. When Jesus speaks of the seed and good soil, the word or message of the kingdom in 1319 is the purpose or motivation expected to be understood and then believed to yield hope and strength to obey in tribulation, which could be pressure, especially internal, or persecution, external, also yielding forth in us love, faith, and direction to avoid sinful cares and trickery of this age. This addresses both the temptation we face as well as growth in us to avoid stagnation. So look at some of the things I've bolded and highlighted here. The word of the kingdom, right? There's an understanding expected. This root, endurance, tribulation and persecution that are going to come. Not giving in to the cares of this world or deceitfulness, but to actually be good ground. Now, even if Jesus is not yet on the throne of David, he is on his father's throne in heaven, which we see in Revelation 3.22. He has not left any disciples as orphans. The helper or advocate, the Holy Spirit, which is the very powerful personal presence of both God and Jesus, is in us to help us overcome and grow. Yes, we have the church and scripture, but it is by the Spirit the world is convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in or obey Jesus. Of righteousness, because he went to his Father, which means he is able to share with us from the throne 
how he actually overcame every temptation and how Jesus himself grew in favor with God, see Luke 2.52, and how Jesus himself learned obedience through suffering, see Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. The conviction of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged, encourages us to take up our cross daily and deny ourselves as Jesus preached in Luke 9.23. Because Jesus overcame in the flesh the ruler of this world, Satan, ultimately defeating him. The conviction of judgment also speaks of a warning regarding the judgment to come upon the whole world when Jesus returns. So you can see he's addressing here in, in John 14 through 16, his voice, his guidance, both directly, audibly or inaudibly, via our heart, our conscience, through scripture, through the church, the body of Christ. And he's addressing not just temptation, but growth in us. The very same evening that Jesus spoke this of the Holy Spirit, he also spoke of the new covenant, which of course is tied to the spirit and not the letter. This is extremely important and one of the primary things seen in the book of Acts, Paul's writings, and in the book of Hebrews as Jeremiah and Ezekiel predicted. As wonderful and as essential as the Bible is, God and Jesus write their laws by the spirit on our minds and hearts as scripture said. It's the new covenant in his blood, and he's bestowing or making or covenanting upon his disciples a kingdom. So a quick history lesson here. With a majority of the New Testament scriptures that were written sometime between 49 to 65 AD, and time needed for them to circulate, and the majority of folks probably hearing maybe a message or two, and then being exposed to conflicting teachings by, let's say, the the Judaizers of the circumcision, or Gnosticism, the, the evil flesh and sin is okay doctrines, or Jesus is a spirit and not a man, docetism, uh, the Greek immortal soul reward in heaven or eons um, instead of the kingdom of God on earth, etc. You could compare what they heard and what they were faced with today to a new Christian starting to read Mark, for example, and maybe starting to read the book of Romans, and they've heard a message or two then they're exposed to conflicting teachings in churches or online. With the work of growing in knowledge, fellowship with the body, and influence of the Spirit, God and Jesus' power and presence in us, on a heart that is, you know, what is most important, what is absolutely essential, we have to be patient with people and we have to make sure we're not bludgeoning them with New Testament writings to smash people and constantly accuse them of disobedience who are just learning. Remember Matthew 7, 1 through 4, what Jesus warned. Remember also what Jesus warned in Luke 6, to be merciful. If we expect mercy, we have to give it. So you have to be patient with yourself and with others as you're learning and you're growing in these things. Remember how the Spirit led Peter to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 to add the gospel to the love of God Cornelius had and the righteousness he was already working. This shows the expectation of growth, but we are also accountable to what is spoken to us by the Spirit, as Jesus said in John 15, 22. It's a sliding scale that we're being judged under, and it has warnings constantly along the way. Center of Paul's letter to Rome, note his emphasis on our obedience, which leads to more righteousness, connecting to the teaching that we received. So he says we're slaves to the one whom we obey, of sin leading to death, or obedience leading to righteousness. But we can thank God that though we were slaves of sin, we obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that we were delivered to. And especially the working of the Spirit of God and Christ in us as we operate according to the Spirit and not according to the fleshy desires. So he tells us in Romans 8 that those who are in the flesh can't please God. But you are not in the flesh, you're not operating in that mode, in those inclinations, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. 
Paul exhorts Timothy to focus and exercise himself toward godliness. Note that word godliness or eusebia, someone's inner response to the things of God, which shows itself in godly piety or reverence. So godly heart response from the word help here is, is very key. We also see in verse eight, the present life and the life to come. So if you're exercising yourself toward godliness and you see that godliness is profitable for all things, it both has the promise of the life that now is, what you're doing right now, and also that which is to come. So there's a future and a present aspect of this. And again, to Titus, denying the flesh and living righteously, godly, is for the present age, notice. While we look forward in hope to Jesus' glorious parousia, or his triumphal return, and the age to come. So he warns that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. This is perhaps my favorite verse in the entire Bible, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. It demonstrates who Jesus really was, that although he was never disobedient, he learned still learning obedience. It shows us that suffering and obedience are part of the process to inherit life in the age to come or eternal salvation. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. In Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter specifically exhorts us to add seven things to our faith. Also, we've been given all things we need for life and godliness. And it is not just Bible knowledge, good as that may be, that we add to our faith. Note virtue, self-control, godliness, love. All these things are given through knowledge of him, Jesus, not just historically who he was, although certainly that too, but especially how he overcame and grew in these same things in the obedience of faith. Peter's conclusion of this section is that doing these very things not only is what prevents you from stumbling, but it ensures your entrance into the kingdom of God. If you do these things, you will never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, so these are some re reactions that people have to obedience. Number one would be, but I don't know or understand everything. Okay, yes, neither did Jesus his entire life. If you look at Luke 2.52, Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, John 15.22, and 1 John 1, 5 through 7, and we also remember Cornelius in Acts 10, you recognize that God knows you don't know or understand everything. Also remember James 4.17. It's to him who knows the good and fails to do it. To him it is sin. Needing growth is not a sin, but growth is a process that is part of our obedience, according to 2 Peter 1, 5 through 9. Second reaction, but I've messed up so many times in the past. Yeah, me too. But God's plan for his kingdom involves those who will overcome. Your faith is in what God and Christ can do in and through you today and tomorrow, not how you have failed in the past, if, if you've repented and been forgiven. Temptation comes from the external forces, such as wicked people or devil, and from internal sources or forces at work, such as your own flesh or your own desires. And God always gives you a way to overcome each trial. It is excellent news that you can resist the devil, James 4, 7, and that you can absolutely control yourself to take the way out of every temptation. See 1 Corinthians 10, 13.
The third one is, but I see so many disobedient professing Christians. Okay, well, don't follow them. Follow Christ. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. The standard of obedience doesn't change just because many fail to meet that standard. In other words, if I, if you, if we sin, if we fail to meet the standard, does the standard change? No. The expected standard that God set and that Jesus met is 100%. Each temptation, get an A+. Each temptation is the equivalent of a moral test of your love of God. The test has one question. You either get a 100% and overcome, or you get an F and fail and sin. Okay, so how do we do it? How do we obey? Well, here it is in three not-so-easy steps. The first one, and perhaps the hardest, is to see self. The second would be to de the desire to overcome or change has to be greater than your current state. This could be for temptation or for growth. And then the third step is to apply your faith, the power of God and Christ, and knowledge. And this is all with help, of course. All right, each of us is individually our own worst critic. It's always the other guy or girl that needs improvement. It's not me, or so we think. It is so difficult to see ourselves as we truly are, yet we are called, encouraged, and even commanded to do so. So how do we do it? Well, God's light searches and penetrates our hearts, showing us where the need to improve is. And the scriptures and body of Christ are also crucial for this. So looking at each of these, you can see Job says, yet I do not know myself. The psalmist writes in Psalm 19, who can discern his own errors? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Paul says, I know of nothing against myself, yet... I am not justified by this. The one who judges me is the Lord in 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, he encourages us to examine ourselves, test ourselves to see if we're living in the faith so that we are not disqualified. And then the psalmist in 139 says, Search my heart, O God. Know my anxieties. See if there's any wicked otsev way in me. So regarding Psalm 139, I used to have a very strong resistance to the latter portion of the verse until I realized that wicked here in the Hebrew is it's actually a very rare word. It's not the normal word for wicked, which only occurs three times in the entire Bible. But otsev can be translated as idle, wicked, stumbling, offense, sorrow, pain, or just a hurtful way. Over a dozen translations rightly translate a hurtful or offensive. So your prayer, my prayer of Psalm 139 should be a request to see if any of our attitudes, understandings, our habits or patterns of thought are hurtful or offensive to God's truth, to ourselves or to others. If any within us are hurtful or offensive, we must see them first to change how we operate internally and so change how we operate externally or through our outward actions. Two, our desire to overcome or change has to exceed our current state. This could be a desire to overcome temptation, or it could be a desire to grow in a certain area. So note in these two examples of Jesus that Jesus is asking what their desires are, which might be obvious, but many people today don't really have the desire to overcome temptation or to grow, but they would rather wallow in self-pity and despair of their condition. We must want healing, victory, or growth badly enough that it completely overwhelms our current situation or present state, whether that current state is a powerful temptation or simply a lack in any area of our faith. Step three, we have to apply faith, power, and knowledge. We then have to believe it's possible that the power of God and Christ can do this work in us with our complete cooperation, of course, which is part, the part where our trusting relationship or faith comes in. Note that Revelation 12, 11 includes the previously mentioned concepts. It is not just Bible or scripture knowledge, but our knowledge of ourselves while we deny our self-will. The word of our testimony is scripture, yes but also the testimony of Jesus' life, as the book mentions elsewhere. But it's also our own testimony. I don't just mean how we initially repented and began to follow Jesus. It certainly includes that. 
but there is a weekly, often daily testimony we have to share with each other of how we've been equipped to overcome temptation or sin, as well as to grow. I don't have time to go into the blood of the lamb and all the depth of uh, from just this verse, but as most know, Jesus' blood, it cleanses us initially for past or previous sins. You can see 2 Peter 1 and Romans 3 for that. But there's also a deeper study of John 6 and 1 John 5 that reveal Jesus' blood also embodies his words, which are spirit and life. It's what he is continuously speaking to us if we listen right now from his Father's throne in heaven until his return. So we've got to believe he's able to do this. We have to have faith to make us well and power, love, and sound mind from that spirit that we're given. So to summarize this in a single graphical representation, your or my perspective could be off on anything. We could call this blind spots. So I've defined them here as stuff I get wrong or incorrect. It's lawful, but not beneficial or helpful or edifying as we see in Romans 5, 13, which shows it, you know, not being accounted to us as sin. And 1 Corinthians 6 and 10 as well, mentioning lawful but not beneficial, helpful, or edifying. So I, I don't see or I, ha I don't have light over these things. These could be attitudes. They could be doctrines. They could be feelings. They could be habits, opinions, or even my actions, perspective, or words from past or even a current situation that I'm in. But if I'm walking in the light, i.e. doing and saying all I know to be morally right, 1 John 1, 7, then I'm acknowledging, I'm reconciling, and I'm fixing these blind spots. I get more light, and the result is growth. Although one could grammatically call these blind spots or errors sin or missing a mark, sure, but sin is not imputed or calculated or charged or reckoned where there is no law, as Romans 5.13 states. In other words, where Jesus has not come and spoken to us, see John 15, verse 22, we would have no sin for that area. When he speaks to one and they do not heed, such a person then has no longer any excuse for his or her error or sin. This sliding scale holds us accountable for what we should reasonably know according to God's light, yet also holds us responsible for forward momentum, progress, growth, all without guilt, provided we walk in the light as he is in the light, as 1 John 1, 7 suggests. So what if I don't acknowledge, reconcile, or fix these things? Well, you're gonna have a hindrance of your race. You're gonna have weights that slow you down, and you're gonna have a hindrance of growth. Hebrews 12.1. There's going to be a loss of fellowship with the body of Christ, the saints, 1 John 1, 7, walking in the light. There's also going to be less intimacy with God and Jesus, and there's going to be no fruit. John 14 and 15 suggest this. There's going to be less understanding, or ultimately, you're going to have sin, you're going to have pride, you're going to have a darkened heart, as we see in James 4.17 and Romans 14.23, that we're not acknowledging these things and acting on them from faith. We're going to become an enemy of God, James 4, 4. And then finally, we're going to have no inheritance in the kingdom of God, but we're going to have destruction, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. So what the obedience of faith does not mean, okay? I want to make sure I'm very clear here. Neither Jesus nor any apostle emphasized these five things or more for anyone in the new covenant. So when we see... Like people preaching this, you know, as many of the 613 commands in the law of Moses as possible. That's that's what you're supposed to do. No, that's not what obedience to the faith means. What about every Old Testament law, including stoning and sacrifices in the Levitical priesthood? No. What about what I call the strive for five? Oh, the Sabbath, the feast, the circumcision, the dietary laws and the tassels or fringes. Oh, the, the easy ones. No. Look, again, there's there's no record of Jesus or any apostle emphasizing these for anyone in the new covenant. So compelling obedience to such under the new covenant, this is something that it was so dangerous to the early church that they had a Jerusalem council about it in 49 or 50 AD. And Paul warned the entire region of Galatia that such insistence would cut them off from Christ. See Galatians 5. Anyone using Matthew 5.18 to emphasize Jesus' words 
of not one jot or tittle would pass away from the law until all is fulfilled, should also recognize that Jesus acknowledges in Luke 24, 44, the fulfillment after his resurrection, the very fulfillment of these scriptures being fulfilled concerning him. We should also recognize that if Matthew 5, 18 were meant for these five Old Testament laws, then we also would have to include stoning, sacrifices, and the Levitical priesthood, which are obviously no longer in effect in the New Covenant, all of which are way more than a jot or tittle, which is the smallest stroke of a Hebrew letter. What the obedience of faith does not mean. It does not mean Jesus obeyed for us, so we don't have to do anything. Oh, I'm good. Jesus just did it all. No. It also does not mean I make no mistakes or that sin is impossible for me. No, we make mistakes and sin is possible for every single one of us until we die. It also does not mean I only need to believe, attend church, maybe pay a tithe and read my Bible and pray and that's, that's good enough. No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean I just need to believe all the right doctrines. Oh, if I just have all the right doctrines, then I'll be good. God will overlook everything else. No, that is not obedience of faith. So here's the saying to remember. Obedience is overcoming. Disobedience is destruction. No cross, no kingdom, no righteousness, no reigning. Make no mistake. You are in a battle for your life, the lives of those around you, and for life in the age to come. It's not a war according to the flesh, and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments of every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-6. So, obedience of the faith is not just some doctrine or teaching. It is the very thing God and Jesus are helping you with and examining you for, training you in, and expecting from you to know that they can trust you to rule in the kingdom of God in the age to come. All right. Thank you, Matt. That was great stuff. And uh, I was just thinking as you were wrapping up what uh, Laurie said, nice graphics. <laughs> That's a great presentation there. Uh, we, we should do, um, I was telling Matt, uh, <laughs> we should do a course on how to do PowerPoints. I see so many uh, bad PowerPoints. So that was beautiful. That was great. All right, so I'll bring Matt back here. We have a lot of questions. Uh, remember, one question per viewer due to time, of course, but I do thank you for being here, spending your Saturday morning with us, and Matt will answer some of your questions live. Hi, Matt. Hello, and thank you. Yeah, don't don't use me as the standard for PowerPoint, though. I'm still learning it. <laughs> All right, let's see. We have a lot of questions here. So let us go to uh, this one from David Patrick. Too bad we have to hit the law and justify lawbreaking. What does it mean to trample the sacrifice of Christ a second time? Not oh, okay. Sure. Yeah, I think that person is referring, that's a great question, uh, probably to Hebrews chapter 10, you know, where it's trampling the blood of Christ. And so my understanding of that verse, and I could be off, the, you know, I'm always uh, open to room for improvement, is that he's writing to here, they, the authors that wrote Hebrews, we're not sure of who, they're writing to Hebrew Christians in particular, who were thinking of going back to the law, which was very common for people. And um, and so in order to avoid that, hey, don't you can't go back to that, right? Then you're trying to crucify Christ again. You're basically saying, oh, I can walk in disobedience. I can kind of do it a way that, really were, that covenant was no longer under effect. In fact, the author or authors of Hebrews, uh, I think it's in chapter eight, suggests it's getting old and ready to vanish away. I mean, the temple was about to be destroyed in that generation and it, nothing was gonna be left of it other than the dispersion that was scattered throughout Rome. 
And so going back to that old sacrificial, sacrificial system and sacrifices is really trampling the, the blood of Christ underfoot. And so that's, that's my understanding of it is doing that, which is disobedience, yes. And I, I think you can apply that to any other um, disobedience as well. But that's, that's my understanding of that verse. Uh, thanks. Let's see. So on the same uh, theme, I guess, James asks, what are the commandments of God mentioned in Revelation 12, 17? And I just have that one teed up here, uh, Matt, to help us. So Revelation 12, a vision of the dragon uh, fighting. Uh, and it goes on to say, the earth came to the help of the woman. It opened its mouth, swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to wage war on the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God, who hold the testimony of Jesus. Okay, yeah, so that's a, another great question. My understanding of the commandments of God are those through the Messiah and the new covenant, right? Again, you know, from Luke 22, Jesus said, I covenant with you, right? He's covenanting, and, and it's not for, you know, prosperity in the land of Israel only, like it was in the old covenant, right? This is for the kingdom of God. It's for life in the age to come. It's it's eternal life, living with God, Jesus, the saints, in a renewed paradise and a new heavens and a new earth, right? So we have way bigger promises, as the New Testament tells us, and we also have different commands. Some of them are the same, yes, but Jesus elevated those. Uh, Pleruo in, in Matthew uh, 5, where he says he, he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill or level it up, you could say. If you, many are familiar with video games, right? He's leveling up and accentuating or accentuating the high points of the law, which are the spiritual commands that Jesus gave us. And so the commandments of God and the testimony or and have the testimony of Jesus Christ here in Revelation 12, 17 is not just the testimony about Jesus' life, as important as that is, but it's also everything that Jesus is speaking to you from the throne in heaven. He's guiding you on the right path. Yes, also the Sermon on the Mount that I had demonstrated in the presentation as well. So all of those would be the commands of God, which are now through Jesus. Uh, just to follow up uh, on that question and the verse here. So you have two components there, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Um, a question for me, Matt, how are the commandments of God and the testimony uh, of God to Moses different uh, from those of Jesus. So in other words, the commandments to Moses and the testimony of Moses, how are those things different in Jesus now, if, if you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. So most of them are like a laser pointer focused in on morality, right? If you look at everything I was showing from the Sermon on the Mount, right? We, we don't have a temple anymore. Um, we don't have a sacrificial system anymore to use a couple of them. I mean, even in J Jesus' ministry, as he was presenting the new covenant, one of the things he shared with is he said to the woman in uh, John 4, you know, believe me, woman, the day is coming, and, and now is, presumably in his, his day, right, that uh, you will neither worship on this mountain, you know, what the Samaritans believed, or in Jerusalem. You know, so the, 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 the concept is we're keeping the commands not to do with a sacrificial system, not to do with the temple and all those, but the higher points of the Mosaic law that Jesus emphasized, hey, you, you can't look at a woman with lust even, right? You can't just, you know, yeah, I didn't commit adultery. Okay, well, don't even look at a woman with lust. He basically elevates the standards of the Mosaic law. So that would be the commandments of God as given through Jesus, who said in John 7, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me, right? Those are the commandments of God. Jesus is delivering them to us. And it's through his testimony, what he shared, what's written in the scriptures um, in his day, but also what he's continually sharing for us now. So that's that's what I see as one of the biggest differences. Hopefully that was clear. Thanks, Matt. On the same theme, uh, what did Paul mean then by works of the law? Um, I think So that's an interesting phrase, and it appears multiple times in different letters of his. I would have to go to the individual passage, and sometimes it sounds like he's talking about traditions of the Pharisees. I acknowledge that. Some uh, bring that up. But other times, I think he's talking about the specific works of the law um, that were added. You know, for example, the tassels, right? That was a work of the law that was added because somebody was picking up sticks on the Sabbath and had to be stoned. And so it was supposed to, the, the fringe law, the tassels, were supposed to remind people that they were holy and that, that it was, you even had the color mixture similar to the high priest of what he wore. So that was a work of the law, you could say. 
and some example that Paul may have been referencing, that that was added, but we're not under that. You don't need to wear tassels. In fact, if you have what Christ spoke of, the Holy Spirit in John 14 through 16, at the four, you don't need something at the four corners of your garments. You have Christ, you know, bringing to remembrance uh, you know, by the Holy Spirit, all things that I've commanded you. That's what the tassels were for. They were to remind people of the Mosaic law at the time. So a lot of Mosaic law, you have to look at, okay, which things were added as a, a, an extra reminder that we don't necessarily need. We don't, I used to wear a, what would Jesus do bracelet in college? I, I don't need that, right? I'm not knocking it if somebody feels led to do that, but you don't need that reminder if you've got Christ and God in you, constantly showing you what the right thing to do is. Uh, thanks, Matt. Let's see. Um, from uh, Henry Joseph Martin. <laughs> I was just wondering, uh, Matt, uh, you're a retired military strategist. Could you encourage us uh, during the current war in Israel? How would you see obedience by faith in the current war, uh, pray, etc.? What, what's your suggestion? I uh, love that question. Great one uh, from, from Joe Martin. Yeah, I, I would definitely say pray. Uh, his, his second follow-up question there at the end. That's the biggest thing that most of us can do. I would be cautious about sending money only because there's a lot of deception that takes place in YouTube videos and on the internet, et cetera. Um, I will say that I am sympathetic toward both sides. I know people in the Israeli military um, and I, I'm praying for them and I've tried to encourage them to, to do what's right. Um, I also know people that, or I've known people that are on the Palestinian side of the conflict. And I've, I've had entire master's degree courses and I've taught on uh, the conflict between the two of them. And I would just tell people to try to educate themselves. Look at both sides of this issue. It's not a one side issue. I think you'll find that there is actually good being done on both sides or people attempting to do good, but there's also evil being done clearly on both sides, especially the, the bloodshed and the killing. So yes, absolutely pray. Be cautious about who you support. And let, if it's somebody that you know that's directly aiding in the suffering um, in Gaza, for example, then, then sure, give it to them. But I would just be very cautious of just donating to some big group because you never know where the money is going. And, and again, study the conflict. So pray cautious with the support and really study the conflict on both sides. There are even, you know, this is not me knocking either side. There are even Israeli journalists and uh, authors who have written and they're, they're Jewish and they've said, hey, look, Israel is killing itself by what we are doing to the Palestinians. And again, like I said, I have friends on the Israeli side and I've seen that they have had wrong done to them and they're trying to protect their families. So really educate yourself before you start going and teaching on this. But yeah, the first thing is pray. So great question by Joe. Uh, just to follow up uh, from me, Matt, what about Christians who want to support in the way of joining the military, uh, taking up arms and going over there or just support some, you know, the military? Yeah, I, I would definitely caution against that, right? Um, joining the military in general, I mean, even though I, I, I did it right and, and everybody has to, you know, search the scriptures and their own conscience for it. But the biggest thing that a lot of us are lacking is education. You know, the dark ages, people didn't have enough education. And now we have a flood of information from the internet and conspiracy theories uh, running rampant. So I would encourage everybody to focus first on obedience of the faith in getting yourself right, you know, making sure that you've got the, the plank taken out of your own eyes, Jesus said in Ma Matthew 7. And then you can see clearly to take the speck out of others. Taking up a weapon and going and shooting people or handing people ammunition is is completely out of the question um, from the teachings of Jesus. So I would extremely caution anybody that's trying to go over there, go over there and help people with aid, sure. Uh, medical package, food, whatever. But if, if someone feels led to go over there, I would not do it with weapons and bullets. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal, right? As I read in, from 2 Corinthians 10, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That is the fight that we are in. It's not a fight with fists or knives or guns. Yeah, amen. And for anyone interested, I uh, we did your faith story and you also did other videos with us. So go and check out Matt's uh, testimony, personal testimony about his uh, background, et cetera, and his change of heart. Okay, let's move ahead here. A few more, if you don't mind, uh, Matt. Um, can you speak more on, on so-called Christian or sinless perfection? So could you, First, give sort of a brief, your brief definition of what that means and and your position on it. 
Yeah, absolutely. I love this question. Um, and it, it does come up a lot, especially when we, we look at scripture and, and obedience, right? Um, I, I would say that I do see a difference between Christian perfection, as John Wesley taught. I'm not a Methodist, but I've read some of his writings and what a lot of people commonly today call sinless perfection. And I'll say this, um, some people may be offended, but all of us believe, and I'm about to see seemingly contradict this in a second, but all of us believe sinless perfection, at least for Jesus, right? We know that he was without sin, and we know that he was perfect his entire life. The question is, can Christians walk in perfection? Can, can we be perfect, right? Is usually the, the follow-up for that. So yeah, all of us acknowledge that yes, Jesus was without sin, Usually the term sinless, you don't see it in scripture. You do see perfection and perfect. But um, I, I believe the Greek word is anamartitos. Um, I might be mispronouncing it. I'm not a Greek scholar. But in John 8, 7, Jesus used it. Who's, who can say I am without sin or without sinless, right? So it does appear in scripture. And I think all of us would acknowledge, yes, I have sinned. Um, the, the, the bigger thing, though, is you have to ask this other question. You have to say, does God want you sinful and imperfect for the rest of your life? The obvious answer is no, right? Go and sin no more. Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So, so what do we do with this? How do we reconcile these? Because there's two errors that I have seen that have happened. One is for people to just say, oh, I just throw my hands up. I can't do it. It's impossible to be perfect, right? Um, so I'm going to sin the rest of my life. Big error. The other error on the other side is, oh, I'm perfect and sinless and uh, it, sin is impossible for me. No, those are both complete garbage. I actually did an entire presentation with uh, Tracy from KOG Miss Missions on this topic. And one of the things I share, just as a final point, is if you look at the words in Matthew 5.48, where Jesus commands it, it's a command for now. And you can look at this on uh, Bible Hub, and I actually have it here if, if we have time to bring up the slide, but I don't have to. Um, Philippians 3.15, Paul talks to those as many as are mature or perfect. Um, same Greek word. It's for those who are now. But yet in that same passage, Paul acknowledges in Philippians 3.12, that he says, not that I've already attained or I've already been perfected. So you're like, wait a second, what is the difference here? It's the same perfected that Jesus was not until the third day when he was risen. And you can see Luke 13, 32 for that. He said, you know, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures and miracles. And the third day I shall be perfected. Well, what's going on here? We already know Jesus was already perfect. And in fact, the, he, the verse I quoted in the presentation, Hebrews 5, 9, talks about having been perfected he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So very similar Greek word, but the, the difference from what I understand, I have actually run that slide by Sir Anthony Buzzard before I uh, presented it with Tracy over a year ago, is that one is for the future, you know, the perfection that we attain in the kingdom. Okay, so what is the now? How can I possibly be perfect now? Or, or you or any of us? Well, if you are a Christian and you know of nothing against yourself, you've been cleansed for your past sin. And just like Paul, I know of nothing against myself. Uh, but I'm not justified this. He who judges me is the Lord. We have to remember that Otsev that I mentioned in Hebrew or in uh, Psalm 139. Um, that is, you know, looking to see if there's any hurtful way in me. Maybe there's something God hasn't shown me. So we should be walking with humility, knowing, yes, I can be walking in obedience, doing all I know to be right. I'm cleansed from my past sin. So that's the perfect that Paul was speaking as many as are perfect or mature. Um, or that's the perfect Christ expects of you right now. And, and again, you know, that slide that I had with the hearts on it. That, that was to try to address this issue so that people recognize there's absolutely growth in you. Don't claim sin is an impossibility. That's that's nonsense. It, it, it absolutely could happen. You need to be on guard. But you could walk the rest of your life without sinning. It's possible. It's just you really have to be on guard constantly and walk in humility and receive everything Christ and the body of Christ have for you. So sorry it was long-winded, but that's a very big, deep topic. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Matt. No, you're doing great. These are very uh, full questions, very good questions. A uh, couple more. Thank you, Matt, for addressing this deep topic. How would you address someone who says uh, we do not need to repent because of grace and that obedience is a, quote, work? Oh, wonderful question. Um, I, I would address John 6. I would go to Jesus' words, and I'll, I'll pull it up right here in my Bible. John, in John 6, Jesus is talking to the crowds and uh, some specific questions he gets. And one of the things that he says, because they asked him in John 6, 28, they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? So this is a legitimate question. What are we supposed to do as the work of God, right? And Jesus's answer is, this is the work of God. Here it is. This is what Jesus says, that you believe in him whom he sent. Okay, so is that something God does for you? Or 
and I know she's asking this for the sake of, of everyone, right? Um, is, is this something that God does for you or for us? Or do we actually have to do it like Jesus said, right? No, we have to do it. We, the, the answer is obvious from Jesus. You have to believe and remember what believe means, how it's akin to, you know, placing your faith in and following on Jesus. So yes, repentance is a work. Yes, belief in Christ is even a work according to Jesus' own mouth. So when people have an issue with that, and they're saying, oh, faith alone. Okay, well, newsflash, the only time, two times that faith alone appears in, in the book of James, in the entire New Testament, is in the book of James chapter two, I believe it is, it might be in uh, some in chapter one as well, but it says is dead. Faith alone or faith by itself, some versions say, is dead. So when people are preaching this faith alone, they're really pe preaching dead faith. Um, and I would also reemphasize what I had noted in uh, Second Peter, um, Second Peter chapter one. We are to add those seven things to our faith, right? So if Peter is telling us by the Holy Spirit that we're supposed to add things to our faith, faith alone is really actually faithless garbage, is what it is. So great question. I know it has to be addressed. So I, I, I thank her for uh, bringing that up. All right, one last one here before we let you go from Sharon. Are we under the new second covenant now or after Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom on earth? Oh, wonderful question. I, um, the new second covenant, I'm assuming she's saying new slash second covenant. Um, yeah, we are definitely under the new covenant. And I, I know that's confusing to some people because Christ hasn't returned. In fact, that's what a lot of Jewish uh, people are waiting for, right? The, the return of, or the Messiah. The, you know, the initial coming of him, as they believe. For us, it's, it's Jesus' parousia, his return. And what I would say to that is, look at when the law was given by Moses uh, for the old covenant, right? First of all, there were some commands that were given, even when they were still in Egypt, that they were going to come out and they were going to do some offerings and sacrifices to God, right? So obedience was a choice that they had to make. They had a choice to make of, you know, painting the blood um, on their doorposts and lintels, right? So there were some commands God was already giving them at the very first Passover before they left Egypt. When you fast forward to Mount Sinai and God is giving commands, it, does it have to wait until all those commands in the entire book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are written? Of course not. They, would, they were to expected to start obeying right then, even before they were into, entering into the promised land, which Moses himself didn't even enter, right? He got to see it before he died. So yes, we have not entered the promised land of you know, the kingdom of God, and it's full on this earth as G when Jesus returns and establishes it. We haven't entered the new heavens and new earth, obviously, but but the, the commands have gone out already, and we are absolutely to, to keep them now under the new covenant from the Messiah who gave them. Just like in the old, they were to obey the voice of Moses and the 70 elders or 72 elders that were appointed, uh, Aaron, if you include Aaron and uh, his brother and Moses. So hopefully that helps uh, answer that question for, for everyone. Amen. Thanks, Matt. So yes, just to add to that, 2 Corinthians 3, uh, he has qualified us to be ministers of a new covenant, not of letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives, gives life. 2 Corinthians 3, uh, 6. Uh, thanks, Matt, for that. Thanks again for Thank all you your me. work. Thank you. So if you have any other questions for Matt Sacra, all for Christ Fellowship at gmail.com. Uh, if you'd like to contact him, if you did not get your question in, once again, great job there, uh, Matt Sacra. All right, moving right along here before the lunch break, we have a presentation pre-recorded from Barbara, Barbara Buzzard. <coughs> Uh, began studying psychology, but moved to England, married Sir Anthony Buzzard. While raising her three daughters, she, she tried her hand at landscaping, enjoys writing articles, reviews for Focus on the Kingdom. She's a passionate pro-life advocate and all things Bible and creation. So today she will talk to you about Follow the Science. So here's a pre-recording. She's not with us live. So we'll just play this and then I'll be back here live. My attempt today is to offer some talking points, some answers to questions, some ways to get into the conversation about abortion. I hope to give perhaps some new or different ways to think about the subject so as to be that light to the world that we were meant to be. 
it's very possible that we've become jaundiced, thinking that we've heard it all before. As you are able to engage with others to help, to teach, I say, come, let us reason together. I have no condemnation whatsoever for anyone who has had an abortion or who has been involved in the abortion industry and has repented. God's forgiveness will cover all. Mine is not a war on choice. It's a revulsion against killing. It is said that there are three types of people, those who see, those who see when they are shown, and those who do not see. I would like to help you to see even more clearly so that you can help others to see. Assuming that you are a pro-life individual, you and I are the people who see. We can't ever impact those who will never see or are determined not to see, but we can open the eyes of those who see when they are shown. These are the people I'm trying to reach with your help. My favorite example of this is a man who accepted a pro-life brochure on the street. He took his time and read it thoroughly. Then he said, thank you, and in a broken voice, I didn't know. The thing is, this abomination called abortion has become so embedded in our society and has so infected the thinking of many that its horror has become acceptable. It has become the new normal. If we were to follow the science, that would inform us that without a shadow of a doubt, life begins at conception. We continue to be deceived by those who treat the unborn as though they were not human. This is an assault on science. We've reached the low point in society where our leaders are now celebrating abortion, hailing it as a wonderful and sacred thing. What is profane is regarded as sacred in our very broken world. I have a puzzle to put to you. When Roe v. Wade was first made into law, at least one half of the country were utterly horrified. Fifty years later, those same people have acquiesced, have given in. And here's the thing. They seem to take their cues about what is right and wrong from the law. That's dangerous and incoherent for a Christian. And please note this. There is not one TV network that dares to show what an abortion actually is. Abortionists engage in acts so offensive to the public that most media outlets refuse to describe them, even in the abortionist's own words. The evil one has a vested interest in our blindness. We probably all have earned the equivalent of a doctorate in pro-choice thinking, twisted thinking. Some have even begun to speak about the sanctity of choice rather than the sanctity of life, a world that has lost its mind. We must ask ourselves this, why does someone die every time we utilize the word choice? Choice has become a euphemism for abortion. It totally disguises the horrors of abortion. We're nearly drowning in pro-choice rhetoric, but it's fraudulent thinking. For years, the pro-choice position has had a hotline to our brains. For example, in the name of women's rights, Babies' rights are snuffed out. It's incoherent that the right to life increases with size. For example, toddlers and adolescents have less right to life than adults. Why didn't we ask ourselves every time we heard women's rights, what about the baby's rights to go on living? The lies embedded in the slogans of the pro-choice have all but crippled us. Every child, a wanted child, the measure is what we do with those who are not wanted. Shall we care for them or shall we kill them? And we are told that a fetus is not a person. Let me ask you this. What magic happens at the moment of birth to make what is not a person into a person? If it's a human being in the light of day, it's a human being in the darkness of the womb 60 seconds earlier. Please consider this every time you hear someone promote abortion up until the moment of birth, as our leaders are now doing. There is no magic in a four inch trip through the birth, birth canal that can make something human 
that is not already human. Birth does not make you a human. There is an unrecognized disaster that has happened in our society, which needs to be recognized. What has happened on a large scale is that those who are not pro-choice have ceased to talk about it. We have chosen not to think about it, not to make our voices known, not to educate, but to tolerate. We've been silent about a blasphemy, but the fact is that the more abortion gets talked about, the more the babies win. The more you know, the more passionate you can be. And then there is this excellent news. Three quarters of those marching in pro-life marches are younger than Roe v. Wade. They can see that this killing is wrong and they're willing to say so. Whereas my generation has acquiesced to the killing and are willing to be silent about it, we've been deceived and have believed the lies. You will often see slogans that say, my generation will end abortion. Do you have any truth to tell? Or have you been beaten down by the world? The answer to this is tied in with what you plan to say to Jesus regarding your actions in this case. Our marching orders are these. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan. If you have spoken up for life, you may well be encouraging others to speak. We must encourage others to speak, your pastor especially. There have been several excellent pro-life movies and br many brilliant books to equip ourselves to have a conversation. Follow the science. A heartbeat at three weeks means that abortion is going to stop that beating heart. Please listen to Senator Kennedy as he attempts to get at the truth about abortion. And please know that millions of people do not actually know what happens in an abortion. Yes, it may be uncomfortable, but should we be shielded from the truth? You have to know what is going on in order to stand against it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor Myers, um, you are here at the invitation of my Democratic colleagues, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, in his opening statement, my good friend Senator Whitehouse said, I want to quote, reproductive justice is economic justice, close quote. Do you agree with that? I might, as an economist, use the word rights, but yeah, I do agree with that. Okay. That's not true for the baby, is it? Well, first of all, I would refer to a fetus. Not yeah, a but that's, well, a fetus. I refer to it as a baby. That's not true as a, for the baby, is it? The evidence that I presented to you, Senator Kennedy, was evidence about measurable effects on the lives of women, families, right. and children. Right, I got that part, but that's not true for the baby, is it? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really understand Well, it's not question. true. Let me put it, let me be I th clear. Let me I'm back sorry. up. As an, as an economist, I measure effects using data. I'm not here to talk about ethics, assignment of right. personhood. That's not my Well, but you goal. said you agreed with the chairman's statement that reproductive justice is economic justice. There is no economic justice for the baby because the baby's dead, right? I wouldn't refer, I, I, I don't really know how to answer your question. I would, you know, I would refer to Was the, the baby fetus. dead or alive? I'm ref we're referring to a fetus. Okay, is the fetus dead or alive after an abortion? The fetus would be dead after okay. an abortion. Okay, all right. Do you, if, the, if the mother is healthy and the baby is healthy, do, do you support abortion up to the moment of birth? So I, you know, I think that's, that's a really hard question to answer because that just doesn't happen. You're asking me about something that simply doesn't happen. Well, it's I think, legal. I, it's, I will tell it's you legal, that, It's legal in uh, Vermont, New Jersey, Oregon, Colorado, New Mexico, Alaska, and the District of Columbia. And, and uh, the loon wing of the Democratic Party supports abortion up to the moment of birth. So do you support that or, or oppose it? I don't think, let me say, I'm here to talk about the economics 
of abortion. No, you're here as an expert. And I'm I, asking as, I think you're you asking believe. me a question as a person, which I'll answer as a person. Okay, tell me as a person. Um, I, I will tell you as a person that I have ambivalence about abortion. I will tell you as a person, I haven't personally had an abortion. And I will also tell you as a person looking at the evidence around me and understanding how complex the decisions are that people face. Okay. I'm just simply uncomfortable I gotta move on, thinking that there's a simple I don't think, I don't answer think that applies answer to everyone. Question. I trust um, women and their health care providers. Yeah, it's real simple. You either support abortion for a healthy mother and baby up to the moment of birth or you don't. And I, I don't think it's a difficult question. H how about you, doctor? Do you support if the mother is healthy and the baby's healthy, do you support abortion up to the moment of birth? So, Senator, you're using really inflammatory language to talk about a medical procedure, and it's not a simple yes or no. Not to mention when you make okay. statements like that, you're erasing the grief right. and the trauma you're, that my patients are You're not going to answer through. my question either, are you? It's not a question that I can think be I, answered I think I know in an your appropriate answer. way, I think, I think I know your answer. Um, Mrs. Ford, okay, let's take a baby at 21 weeks. Hold up, Mark. This is a baby at 21 weeks, okay? Um, the baby can feel pain, right? Yes. And the baby's pretty developed, right? Yes. And do you know the name of the procedure that the doctor would use to abort that baby at 21 weeks? I'm not a doctor, but I believe it's a DNR. It's called dilation and evacuation. Is that right? As far as I understand, yeah. Yeah, and first, uh, the doctor would, would, would dilate um, the cervix, and then the doctor would take what's called, a, they, the doctor would call it a sofa clamp. It's really a pair of pliers with sharp teeth on the end. And without giving the baby any pain medication, the doctor would go through the vagina, through the uterus, and start tearing the baby apart. Is that right? As far as I understand the procedure. Yeah, and she might start with the legs and pull them out, and the arms and pull them out, right? And then she might go for the, for the heart or the spine and just pull the baby out piece by piece. Is that right? Without giving the baby pain medication. That's what I understand the procedure to be. Okay. But then you got to get the head out. The baby's dead, but maybe not. Maybe it's still in pain. But then you, you got to get the head out. And even with the cervix dilated, you got to get the head out, which is hard. So then the doctor would go in and, and, and use those pliers to crush the baby's head. Is that right? As far as I understand. And then she'd pull the head out, the crushed skull out. Right? Mm -hmm. My prayer is that truth will make abortion unthinkable. There were hundreds of comments after the video. One man called it the most horrific thing in human history. Many denounced it as just pure evil. Here's some points to counter pro-choice arguments, courtesy of Randy Alcorn's wonderful book, Pro-Life Answers to Pro-Choice Arguments. A woman must have the right to choose, but that right to choose is restricted whenever that choice would harm an innocent person. Freedom to choose is a ubiquitous but meaningless concept. Freedom to choose what? Killing. It's a private deci decision between a woman and her doctor. Should we allow parents to abuse a to toddler if it's done in private? Note that the approval by a doctor does not alter the nature or the morality of abortion. Please see and acknowledge this faulty thinking. If you cannot afford a child, you should be free to abort it. Can you kill a toddler if he or she becomes too expensive? This is a very complex issue. Women agonize over it. We must ask the question, is it okay to kill my toddler if I agonize over it? Is it fair to bring into the world an unwanted child we might challenge this question with another. Is it fair to kill a toddler if I no longer want him? How do we deal with the accusation that we are forcing our morality on all women? The answer lies in this. If you saw a mother abusing her child, 
you would feel justified in forcing your morality upon her. Every woman should have control of her own body. Reproductive freedom is a right. Since half of the babies aborted are females, at least 650,000 have had that right stolen from them by those who chose to abort them. I have the right to control my body, but does that ownership give us the right to kill innocent people we find on our property? I have the right to control my life, not when it becomes the right to hurt and oppress others. This is rather, rather like the analogy that your right to extend your arm ends where my nose begins. We must have the right to choose. Our pro-choice responses are often arbitrary. We are not pro-choice about seat belts, robbing banks, or child abuse. There are a couple of stop them in their tracks questions which can be asked gently and uncritically, such as, how do you know that to be true? Do you think you could believe something that isn't true? What if you're wrong? Suggest that every time they hear the word choice, know that someone has to die. Fill in the blank. It's okay to kill a baby in the womb when Ray Comfort, a New Zealand author and speaker, challenges the public with this. Since fetus is the Latin word for baby or offspring, does it make any sense to, de to deny that abortion takes that baby's life? The word right used in the context of abortion means right to kill. So every time you hear women's rights, ask yourself, where was the baby's right to continue living? Much of the work of pro-life activists is to help us clarify our thinking. Much of the thinking of pro-choice people is denial. We also have this working against us. What we all know to be true, we refuse to admit because of the difficulty it will make for us. Our consciences are soothed by euphemisms like women's health care. Before the abortion, the baby in the womb is alive. After the abortion, it is dead. It should revolt and sicken us. Jesus used his right of free speech as outrage what was being done in the temple. Our sense of outrage should be in proportion to the enormity of the evil. How did they do it? Lies and word games. I could never speak about abortion without speaking about the lies that it was built on. Lies upon lies upon lies. A very dark agenda, a blight and a scourge. Abortion relies on lies and deception. Those lies kill unborn children. In Roe, the Supreme Court admitted, if personhood for the unborn is established, the case of course collapses, for the fetus's right to life is then guaranteed specifically by the 14th Amendment. How did they do it? How did they ram through the Roe v. Wade ruling? We didn't fight back. We allowed ourselves to be deceived. The deceit has only been magnified so that we don't even recognize what murder is. Those who control language control thought. Verbal engineering always precedes social engineering. It's a schizophrenic assault on truth. It's fraudulent thinking, medicalized destruction and elimination. The use of non-person is perhaps the best loved hate speech ever. We are reaping the effects of the lies we were told. To our detriment, we were unaware of the planners whose dedicated scheming to invent word games has worked its black magic on our minds. We need to be undeceived. And what about scripture? What about Jesus? Since we must answer to him, doesn't that compel us to be on his side? We all have our own ways of ignoring information we choose not to act upon, but it is to our detriment. We speak about loving our neighbor, but choose to ignore the unborn neighbor. We don't have the right to injure another person in the exercise of our freedoms. That is why murder is a crime in every state. The fact is that abortion always ends a human life, and that's a right we don't have. There is really no such thing as pro-choice. It's either pro-death or pro-life. Those are the only options. There are bizarre and devious ways to attempt to say that the Bible approves abortion. The King James Version uses the phrase that holy thing in Luke 1.35, and some think 
That means that Jesus was still in the womb. He was not yet a person. The most significant thing about abortion legislation is that there is none. It was so unthinkable that an Israelite woman should desire an abortion that there was no need to mention this offense in the criminal code. We are required to think biblically. Multiple scriptures reveal that the unborn are persons. That's why it's wrong to kill them. Our Messiah is named my Lord while still in the womb. The word brephos occurs four times in scripture. In Luke 1, 43 and 44, it refers to an unborn child. But in Luke 2, 16 and Jeremiah 20, 15, the words apply to a born child. So if we were to stake our theology on scripture, we would clearly see that it is forbidden to kill, the, kill a child outside the womb. The same laws and logic apply to a babe in the womb. In the Didache, early second century document under the heading teaching of the Lord to the nations says this, do not slay a child by abortion, nor what is begotten shall you destroy. Demonic involvement? Those angelic hosts who sinned were numerous. They taught men various sins. One taught enchantments, another astrology, another the art or sin of abortion. And so with the help of demonic instruction, we began to chart our course. For 47 years, nine unelected men and women on the Supreme Court have played God with innocent human life. They've invented laws that condemned more than 62 million babies to painful deaths without trial for the crime of being inconvenient. It's utterly inconceivable that any nation, much, much less one with the Christian heritage of America, tolerate this cultural generous genocide against her weakest and most innocent among us. The demonic spirit of modern day King Herod is alive and well on planet Earth. The evil spirit of baby, baby killing has just changed its name to Planned Parenthood. All of them have unspeakable evil in their hearts. If in fact abortion is an updated form of child sacrifice, our indifference to God may well figure in to our national collapse. Can nations destroy their young and expect to survive? The lie that the pre-born are not really human gives us the right to destroy them. Babies who at five weeks can feel pain and have fully developed nervous systems at eight weeks? May God have mercy on us. It's absolutely vital to know that the very man who orchestrated the Roe v. Wade abortion law says that it was demonically conceived and enabled by lying and wickedness. When he repented of his murderous tactics, he spoke of the moral squalor that fed the abortion culture and how he became corrupt. He calls it a barbaric age. He was responsible for making abortion legal, affordable and available on demand. And he ran the largest abortion clinic in the country speaks of the ruthless nihilistic pagan attitudes and beliefs that finally drove him to unleash the abortion monster. I make no apologies to those, those who have heard this before because I think it's positively dangerous not to know the roots of this monster called abortion. He says, in the absence of any but the most crass instruction in moral order, in the presence of contempt for ethical relations with women, indeed for women themselves, in the expectation that I would follow this warped and twisted man, a monster was growing, was germinating within me. This speaker performed over 75,000 abortions himself, only to say later after repentance that a love of abortion is a love of evil, a love of a perversion. Looking back, he regarded abortionists as odious quacks, lowlifes, mutilators, murderers, dirtbags, with no ethical or moral boundaries. That was then, what about today? Abortion is the leading cause of death worldwide, with 73 million killed last year. 65,464,760 babies killed since 1973. This testimony in 2023 between two abortion employees on their lunch break, they'd been discussing the fact that their last patient had asked them if it was a boy or girl. 
showing that she knew that it was a being, not a blob or a piece of tissue. The story continues. When our break was over, we went back into the abortion chamber and invaded and emptied the womb of another woman. My reasoning and conscience never took the next step. Neither she nor I asked the logical next question. Could it be that destroying these little lives is wrong? That it's the wrong thing for the mother as well as the baby? And that it was the wrong thing for the doctor to do in the first place? Shame on us. We sold out at the cost of millions of lives. Doctors should have never accepted the role of executioners when Roe v. Wade was passed. Doctors could have shouted a collective no. We could have insisted that abortion is not medicine and pregnancy is not a disease, but we cowered to the prevailing voices of the day and lost our moral footing. My coworker and I were romanced by the dollars lining our pockets. What if these two abortion employees recognized the lies about abortion and had been challenged with the morality of it? One former abortionist doctor, utterly repentant, says that along with the entire country, she became brainwashed. She says that she had always thought of herself as a good person. That is, until she realized that she had killed more people than most mass murderers. This doctor feels that she became a mass murderer in a holocaust of the unborn. Today, we have actually a new word to cover the ever-expanding industry of abortion. There is now an abortuary, a abortuary chain in at least four states claiming to provide a spa-like experience for your abortion, warm robes, hot tea, etc. Perhaps you could even get your nails done there. This is a world oppressed by the powers of darkness. Those who are pro-abortion are constantly shifting the focus from what happens to when it happens. What happens is beyond hideous, as is demonstrated by the abortion doctor who, when an ultrasound revealed the baby, trying to escape his cutting tools, put them down and never did another one. What about chemical abortions? That's 55% of all abortions. Do it yourself. Available now at your corner drugstore. Taking the mifepristone drug is four times as dangerous to the mother as abortive surgery. It's a dangerous and life-threatening procedure. Pill-related emergency visits are up 500% since the pill was approved. One in 20 who take the drug will require surgery to stop bleeding. Infection is always a risk, all increasing trauma. Mifepristone is linked to between 28 and 32 women's deaths and 4,000 serious complications. Non-fatal complications don't even have to be recorded. Its safety is spread by lying, power-hungry, killing industries. Operation Rescue has been instrumental in documenting the dangers of the drugs for many years. Incomplete abortions, hemorrhaging, ruptured ectopic pregnancies are all common complications. Even the FDA has acknowledged that at least 32 women have died after taking the abortion-inducing drugs since 2000. In Right to Life, ethical reasoning, a seven weeks pregnant abortion is as unacceptable as a 30 weeks pregnant abortion. It's like distinguishing between the killing of two-year-olds and the killing of eight-year-olds. This is an example of the human heart suppressing unwelcome knowledge. We all do it. When a doctor who was used to doing first-term abortions was learning how to do second trimester abortions, he could not as he nearly fainted at the sight and at feeling the life which he would soon extinguish. He simply could not stop thinking about Nazi Germany. The tragedy is multiplied when after his death, a mother remembered, he killed my unborn child in 1978. What a hideous legacy. And so the work of Margaret Sanger, the eugenicist goes on, killing children for profit. If we believe in God, why do we ignore him on this moral issue? How can we survive if we call immoral things moral? Dr. Michael Christie admits, 
I feel that I'm actually killing them. And that kind of feeling I don't like to live with. Money is a big factor in why I do this. And I think that most doctors who do abortions also do them for the money. Another doctor said that doing these abortions was fairly boring, but that she was repulsed with her staff when she got a large fetus. One doctor is noted as saying that before he dies, he wants to forget what it feels like to take a life. The moral question here is moral quicksand. The deliberate push to reverse our moral compass has affected all of us, whether we recognize it or not. On what moral grounds does a mother have the right to choose her baby's expiration date? Everyone on some scale of life is compelled to be an intellectual force. They must think, they must act, they must value. Avoidance of such is the very nature of depravity and the root of society's ills. When you decide that a certain segment of our population can legally be killed, this is like a cancer that has metastasized. Your silence speaks volumes. Is it necessary to engage? It is. Our moral sense was put in us by our creator and not to be ignored. What is your responsibility in all of this and our responsibility to our unborn neighbor? Don't you have to join the side you're on? Most Germans neither aided nor opposed the actions of the Nazis, thereby permitting the Holocaust to occur. Abortion is the worst human rights violation in all history. We must tell ourselves the truth. Abortion is a procedure of elimination. There is a luminous power to truth, but it must be engaged in. We are called to witness all it takes for evil to win is for good men to remain silent. A civilized society does not demand the right to kill its most vulnerable citizens. Who gave us the right to decide who may live and who must die? Abortion is not compatible with being a Christian. It's child sacrifice and it's murder. By contrast, we are to hate bloodshed, silent consent, to the legalization of murder is not acceptable. Abortion is a uniquely heinous sin, so says scripture. It possibly exceeds all previous atrocities with its 60 plus million lives taken. We are to cherish and protect. We are commanded to protect the innocent and rescue those being led away to slaughter. How can good people remain silent. As Dr. Martin Luther King said, our lives begin to end the day we are silent about things that matter. And he also warned that to ignore evil is to become an accomplice to it. Not to speak is to speak. Silence allows evil to win. Who among us has any conception of the dimensions of shame that will befall us and our children when one day the veil has fallen from our eyes and the most horrible of crimes reach the light of day. That was written during the first Holocaust. The abortion Holocaust is beyond the ordinary discourse of morality and rational condemnation. It's not enough to pronounce it absolutely evil. The abortion industry is a new evil, severed from, it, from connections with history, psychology, politics, and morality. This is an evil torn free from its moorings in reason and causality, an ordinary secular corruption raised to unimaginable and limitless extremity. Our hearts are such that we may consciously or unconsciously suppress unwelcome knowledge, but the most dangerous people to deceive are ourselves. Christianity's shockingly awful non-involvement is a betrayal of all that Christians are supposed to stand for. We must enact the faith that we profess. How as Christians can we who have received mercy deny it to the innocent and vulnerable? Those who love God have a duty to stop our society's apathetic acceptance of barbarity and brutality. Where is the outrage of the people of God? As Christians, we are not permitted to call evil good. Not only is it forbidden to us, but it is morally incoherent. 
God hates hands that shed innocent blood. It is never lawful, even for the gravest reasons, to do evil that good may come of it. Evil must never be called good, nor good evil. If good and evil are confused, not only are we more likely to do evil, but we are deprived of one of the greatest gifts ever, to repent and be forgiven. Being part of the attack on life would not put one in a good position to enter the kingdom of God. As believers in the sanctity of life, the power is in our hands to make a difference. As believers, we should help women and men to see the deceit and to stand against it. Let us remember that under the old covenant, the spilled blood of animals was of such value that God deemed it acceptable for sin. And then Jesus' blood was of such incredible value that it was deemed as an acceptable sacrifice for all humanity. The rivers of blood from the killing of babies are a blasphemy against our God. As abortion sucks the life out of those tiny bodies, it can also suck the life out of our souls. May God help us. Thank you, Barbara, for your work there. And uh, here's a list of favorite pro-life slogans I put in the chat uh, that she wanted to add. Also, that was a recorded presentation from Barbara. And also a quick correction on the video. The scriptures should have been at Luke 141, Luke 144, Luke 212, and look to 16. So my apologies for that. So that's a correction on the video. So here are the pro-life slogans also that she wanted to add, if you'd like to look at them on our theological conference site as a PDF. Uh, before we break for lunch, just to uh, my thoughts on this subject of uh, so-called pro-life, and abortion. I Some uh, months ago, weeks ago, I saw a news report a couple of weeks ago of a trial that occurred where a mother was sentenced. And I'll just play the short news clip and then give you some of my commentary. Yeah, we're starting with a really hard story tonight as we hear from a mother who went on vacation, leaving her one-year-old daughter at home in a playpen to starve to death. An emotional day in court here that ended with a judge sentencing Crystal Candelario to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That judge calling her actions the ultimate act of betrayal. Matt Rascone has more from inside the courtroom. We're here on a very tragic case. Prosecutors, the judge and investigators described it as one of the most horrific cases. She is taking a suitcase and now leaving Cuyahoga County. Then 31-year-old Crystal Candelario vacationing in Puerto Rico. She was a mother. She got a title that means something in this world. While her 16-month-old daughter, Jaylene, was trapped in a pack-and-play with her feces for 10 days, starving to death. This baby loved her mother. She needed her mother. And her mother betrayed her. When Candelario finally returned home, she called 911 in a panic. She didn't want this. To happen you could hear that her attorney says she was dealing with depression and anxiety without treatment through an interpreter candelario said she's asked for forgiveness i'm not trying to justify my actions but nobody knew how much i was suffering 
Dios y mi hija me han perdonado. God and my daughter have forgiven me. Prosecutors said after finding her, Candelario changed her daughter's clothes and lied to police to hide her crime, then continued to talk about her fun vacation while in jail. You committed the ultimate act of betrayal. Judge Brendan Sheehan described the bond between mother and child as the most pure and sacred, and then handed down the maximum sentence. You should spend the rest of your life in a cell without freedom. The only difference will be that prison will at least feed you. Just a disturbing story. All of the investigators impacted by this case were inside the courtroom for Jaylene. Candelario's parents also spoke in court lamenting the death of their granddaughter while also standing by their daughter. Candelario is also a mom to a seven-year-old daughter. It's unclear where she was while Candelario was on vacation, Christy. Just, it is one of the saddest things. Yeah. Matt Rascone, thank you. All right, so it's a heavy news report. Um, I was struck by that news report because you saw the utter disdain and emotions and on, on behalf of everyone, including the, the uh, news people reading the news. Uh, the judge said, if you didn't hear you to the woman, you committed the ultimate act of betrayal. Um, so as I was looking at that tragic case, one of many, I was thinking uh, to ask the judge, if I had the opportunity to ask the judge and everyone else in that courtroom, um, why they did not feel the same way for the person in the womb, the, the person that is as the senator in the video that Barbara played, uh, Senator Kennedy asking those ladies, uh, you know, destroying uh, little babies in the womb the way they do. So that disdain, that uh, righteous indignation, if we, if you will, where is it for those millions and millions of, of children killed in the womb? And where is equally the disdain and the punishment for those involved, starting, of course, from the mother who uh, chooses to do that? to her unborn. Uh, have they not committed the ultimate act of betrayal as mothers to do that? So uh, th this is the question I have for, for you and, and to think about. If you're on the fence, by the way, on this subject, uh, yeah, just think about those things very, very, very much so. And uh, thanks again to Barbara for for presentation, um, many comments here. I'll just try and go through some of the comments. Thank you for watching live. Uh, apologies, Barbara, I couldn't be here uh, live, but uh, let's see. This is why Jesus said, raise them up in the true faith and shall not depart when they are older. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Henry Joseph, Barbara, it was brilliant to use Senator, Senator Kennedy's questioning so sad. Thank you. Matt Sacra, where is the baby's right? Uh, great point. When people, let me try this. Uh, when people try to say fetus, it is basically trying to make a human life a mere thing or an animate object rather than a, he, a real human. Uh, scattered Brethren Network, if society starts out by thinking of people as just blobs of flesh, where is the harm in hurting and killing each other at any point during their lives? We numb ourselves to morality. Uh, from Matt again, these are very simple but extremely profound questions Barbara is posing. Love it. From Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions, if you have had an abortion, please watch Carla's testimony and know that there is hope and healing from Shelly. I think my breakfast is going to have to be delayed. Definitely. It should make you, yes, queasy. The antinomian mindset is from the evil one. This rebellion witchcraft, such as abortion, is the cause of the curses upon mankind. Oh, how I love God's law, which is perfect and converts the soul. 
from Daniel, woman has the right, quote, Bible says husband is the head of the wife. Uh, true, uh, Daniel, but let's not forget, obviously, the uh, participation of males in, in this uh, evil. Uh, husbands, from the husbands to the girlfriends or the significant other. Uh, Matt again, wow, I love how she, uh, Barbara included this congressional committee jaw dropping. Uh, Benjamin, when, when someone asks you if you support baby death and you pause, there's a serious problem. James, uh, a few years ago, it came out what Planned Parenthood was doing with the remains of abortions, like Mrs. Buzzard said. Some cannot see, but some can see when shown. Uh, and James says, to defend the practice of abortion, you must change the terminology to change it from murder to choice. Benjamin says, pure evil. And those are just some of the comments. So, yes, uh, we'll end it with, uh, that is pure evil, yes. <clears throat> so... Good message there. Thanks again, Barbara. And uh, we will we will close out the uh, lunch to to go to lunch here. So back in the schedule. Looking at the schedule coming up. So after lunch, Eastern Standard Time. By the way, we are on at two p.m. We will be back with Ken Laprade. And then Tracy at 3 p.m. Oh, and before I forget, uh, the magazine, the Focus on the Kingdom magazine is up online, the PDF. Some of you know Anthony has been publishing, editing this for, I think, 30 years or so. The April one, so just go to Links Magazine, click on April 2024, and you should be able to see a PDF. And there's a very good uh, first article there from Clark Barefoot on John Calvin, if you are interested in that. Calvinism, was John Calvin a Christian in name only? Uh, very good there from Clark. All righty, so we shall break for lunch, as I said. And we will be back at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.